Okay, so today we are going to talk about um, the second Great Awakening. We've already had one uh, with Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. I think we all remember that. Um, but now we're going to have a second Great Awakening. And this little lecture, and this will be part one, is often what I call religion, romanticism, and reform. This is what's going on in America at the time. Uh, you know, American thought and, and culture had been rooted in Puritanism, right? This moral idea of Puritanism, uh, the Enlightenment, we talked about that, and rationalism. And I think I said this before, that America, it was believed, had a mission to serve as a sort of a moral example to the world. And, it, and it's still a theme that we've heard for a long, long time, this city upon the hill. Unfortunately, um, reality had fallen short of expectations. And I, I still would argue that's true today, that we, we want to be this moral example, but our, the reality does fall short of expectations, but America is a, is a country that's on a journey that, that, that doesn't really have an ending in terms of improvement. So let's talk about some of the religious thought at the time. We talked about this once before, the deists, right? The deists believe that uh, God was the clockmaker. He planned the universe, built it, set it in motion, then left it alone. And the deists believe by using your, your reason, people could grasp the natural laws governing the universe, right? You're a scientist, you believe that. Um, Jefferson and Franklin were deists. Uh, and they believe that, okay, if there's natural law for sciences, it might be natural law for society as well. Well, this led, this idea of deism, led a lot of New England churchgoers thinking that they could interpret the scriptures by using, by using, I don't think that's a word, but it is now, their own reasoning. Uh, and many of them started believing they were no longer sinners in, a ha in the hands of an angry God. Remember, that was the thing that was coming out of that first great awakening, that God was angry. He was mad at us. Um, he was mad because we were sinning. We weren't really focusing on the life after this. And so their view of God was a very angry God. Well, this is changing with the second great awakening. And we see some groups that pop out of here. And, and, and a couple of the groups we want to talk about is the Unitarians and the Universalists. Now, New England drifted toward both of these, but um, Unitarianism believed that God was basically benevolent, um, that people were basically good, and that we should use our reason and conscience over established creeds and uh, scriptural literalism, um, and that people were capable of doing tremendous good and that all people were eligible for salvation everybody so there goes that predestination thing out the window i think it might be i might be a universalist because i sort of believe that all people are good and people are, uh, have the the capability to doing tremendous good now uh, the center of this movement was boston which is not surprising boston's the center of a lot of different uh, intellectual movements at the time it uh it appealed to a lot of elite members of society. Now, the parallel movement to that was the Universalists, which attracted wage laborers and people of humbler, humbler means. And they also believed in salvation of all men and women. And they believed, this is interesting, that um, God was really too merciful to condemn anyone, right? Um, that he would never condemn you or I for eternal darnation, because I don't cast, uh, but you get the general idea. Now, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe Adolf Hitler would fall in that category, Charlie Manson and uh, that guy who directed the Transformers movies. Uh, the Unitarians and Universalists will unite and become one church eventually. And they still exist. You'll see them around. Uh, but the thing that we really want to talk about here is what we call the Second Great Awakening. Uh, and this is a reaction, a Protestant reaction, against this deism that was espoused by Franklin and Jefferson. Now, after the revolution uh, in 1783, people began moving west. Before the revolution, uh, population uh, was more or less contained to about 100 miles east of the Appalachian Mountains. Now the population is all the way out to the Mississippi River. And this was the uh, rough frontier way of life. You were isolated. You were into Indian fighting all the time. You did a lot of moonshine drinking. You did a lot of tobacco chewing. Uh, these were people that were hungry for land. Uh, and your life was subject, as it will be throughout the, most of the 1800s, uh, 
subject to be governed by the seasons and daylight. Uh, they were often uh, subject to a lot of disease. A lot of these diseases were uh, primarily of a nutritional value because uh, they had a poor diet of uh, pork and corn, and that was about it. And these are people that are socially I isolated. And they would always look for a way that they could have some sort of get together. Uh, now for churches, this spreading population presented a real challenge. Uh, how do you get the gospel to the people on the frontier? Well, the guy who comes up with the answer to this is a guy named James McGreedy. He's a Presbyterian minister, and he came up with a new form of religious meeting, the so-called camp meeting. He would designate a central place and people would come and camp there and hear revival sermons. Uh, and probably one of the most famous one was the 1801 Cane Ridge uh, uh, Camp Meeting in Kentucky. This was a huge revival. 10 to 25,000 people came to this revival. Families came to camp, each had its own campsite. Uh, there were crude log pulpits that were made for ministers to speak from. And their sermons were very emotional. Uh, and sermons induced extreme physical reactions to those people uh, that heard them. These wild physical movements that people would go through were, would be referred to as exercises. And you can still see uh, some of that. If you watch um, some documentaries on some of the religious uh, denominations, especially in the South, you'll still see people do these kind of exercises. Um, people would scream and fall to the ground. They would conduct the uh, contract that what they call the jerks in which the body is moving back and forth sometimes the whole body's affected uh, they'd often sometimes get down on all fours and start barking this was the idea of um, uh, treeing the devil or they would start laughing the holy laugh or they would speak sometimes um, uh, what they call in tongues in, in some language that no one can understand now anthropologists have at events like this have a name for it and it's called liminality this is when you're taken out of your everyday position in life and you prepare yourself from some emotionally charged experience. It's almost a role reversal from being somebody of the elite to going back to someone as common. Now, the revival ended after about seven days because they ran out of food. Now, the news of the revival went back east and there were a lot of different reactions. Obviously, established Presbyterian clergy hated it. They didn't like this emotional, uh, hysterical breaches of Christian decorum. Uh, they said, you really aren't gonna be able to um, convert people that it's emotional response, response. Conversion should be something that's thought out and studied. But Baptists and Methodists were more enthusiastic. Uh, the Baptists and, Meth Baptists and Methodists will take full advantage of this highly emotional frontier religion with Methodists probably gaining the most. Now, the Methodists at the time of the revolution were a very small group, but by the time of the Civil War, they're the biggest single religious denomination in America. Now, some of you know this, or you may be a, a Methodist. Um, the Methodists were founded by John Wesley. He was an English Anglican and founded the Methodists in 1740. He was dissatisfied with the condition of religion in England. He needed, he said, look, what we need to do is have regular religious discipline to bring the individual closer to God. He wanted the people to follow him with uh, a daily prayer, regular Bible reading in his meditation. Uh, this method of worship um, led his detractors to call him the Methodist and make fun of it. Well, for him, this became a badge of honor. Uh, and so he will reject Calvin's theory of absolute predestination. Uh, he believed that individuals could contribute to their own salvation. And in 1769, the Methodists arrived in America. Now, many leave during the revolution because they were the conservative and loyal to the king. But there was one minister that stayed that becomes very famous, and that's Fra Francis Ashbury. Now, he came to America 1771, somewhere around there, at the age of, I think, 27. And he stayed in America throughout the war. Uh, in 1784, after the revolution, he led a conference in Baltimore, which created the American Methodist, Methodist Church. He becomes what we call a circuit rider, and he's going to travel all over the country, probably, and he said this, that he was probably one of the most traveled Americans in history at that point. That's true. He traveled throughout the seasons, riding a circuit and preaching to different people. 
He spent his summers in the North uh, and winters in the South. He estimated that he probably traveled 300,000 miles on horseback. And historians think that's probably accurate. Um, it was harsh travel. It was tough, as you can imagine, back then traveling by horse and 300,000 miles. But for Ashbery, he said, well, he, he would go back and think of what did Jesus endure, and that helped him get through it. Um, so a lot of me Methodist ministers will follow examples in becoming traveling ministers or circuit riders. It was a low paying job. You were always on the move. You had little time for family. Often it was an early grave. Um, now, one notable circuit rider was a guy by the name of Peter Cartwright, who was ordained by Francis, uh, Francis Ashbury. Cartwright, unlike most ministers at the time, <coughs> was never formally educated. Uh, and in fact, he opposed any sort of uh, educated ministry. Now, he specialized in camp meetings as well. And he knew that the best time to hold a camp meeting was just after the harvest. Um, because now we know that people's work is done. They're looking for a way to, to, to get out and socialize. Uh, and it couldn't be too late in the harvest, usually early November. Um, and Cartwright was a guy who also liked to debate other ministers over um, uh, uh, the scriptures. One time he debated a guy named uh, Sargent who had founded his own church known as the Halcyon Church. Um, Sargent said he was the millennial messenger as a lot of people said at the time. Um, and uh, he said that he was immortal. And so he re uh, refused to eat for 16 days. Well, of course he did die. Uh, and that, that was a problem. Uh, now, he wanted to, people to know that conversion was not easy. It's a struggle. And he said that Methodists were expected to exhibit what they called the feminine virtues, love, forgiveness, uh, humility, and he had argued that men had turned their backs um, on this because they had had this tough, hard uh, drinking, fighting way of life. In other words, if we were going to put that in today's um, uh, language, he would argue that's toxic masculinity, right? He's saying that these people are uh, too macho of men and they need to adopt some feminine virtues. And so... Um, these camp meetings were often charged with emotion uh, because uh, you would see status reversal where people of high status would go to low status or low status to high status. A powerful be people would be humbled by the lower classes. Uh, these are sometimes referred to as inversion rituals. Now, the interesting thing about these revivals is that there were some critical uh, critics of this is that, that they believe, and I, I'm, I'm gonna quote here that more souls were gotten than saved at these camp meetings because uh, people would drink and men and women would get a chance to meet up. I mean, this is one of your ways to go meet women or meet a man was attending these camp rituals. Now, probably the superstar of the revivalists is Charleston Grandson, Charles Grandinson Finney. Uh, he said that he was working as a law clerk one day when Jesus, he, he suddenly felt the presence of Jesus uh, and decided that law wasn't the way to go. He needed to go spread the word. And he's a very captivating revival preacher. He moves his way up and down um, uh, the Erie Canal. And so this upstate New York is often called over the burned over district because there were so many revivals that went through this area. And he wrote a handbook on how to make um, uh, a revival work. And he also popularized, uh, popularized something called the anxious bench. So you put this bench at the front of uh, the gathering uh, and people who had spiritual doubt would sit on the anxious bench. The crowd would come around them um, and pray over them. And, and people would get uh, very excited and worked up and intense over this prayer. And so you could see where if that was you and you were sitting on this bench and this crowd is praying for you and working, uh, working up into this frenzy, how the emotional experience that would be on somebody. Um, now, one of the critics of these people is a man named Lyman Beecher, yeah, that related to Harriet Beecher Stowe. And he's one of these people that says, look, this, this is really a place for uh, den, that there's a, there's a lot of sex there. Ministers are taking advantage of impressionable women. Uh, Beecher said uh, Finney was more like a theater performer and theater was considered very low brow. Uh, 
but uh, the frontier liked to be entertained and Finney knew it. Now, another uh, preacher this time was a guy named William Miller. Uh, he said the end of the world was coming. Uh, and he said the date of that would be March of 1843, then changed it to 1844. He told his followers what we would call the Millerites to give, all, give away all their possessions and prepare, prepare for the coming at the top of the hill. Um, well, as you can imagine, his followers did that. Um, and when the time came, there was no end of the world. Uh, for the Millerites, uh, this became known as the Great Disappointment. And they eventually, we'll come back to this in a later lecture, they will eventually become um, the Seventh-day Adventist. Now, another minister we should talk about that was more popular as a writer than, um, than really a, a preacher was a guy named Parson Weems. Now, you probably best known Parson Weems for telling the story of George Washington, the cherry, cherry tree, the fake story. But he was great at writing pamphlets. Um, and uh, you can see in these um, pamphlet titles uh, what, uh, what the theme is. So he has a book called God's Revenge Against Adultery, God's Revenge Against Gambling, The Bad Wife's Looking Glass, The Drunkard's Looking Glass. So you can see this moral story that he, uh, he's telling here. And he was one of the best-selling writers at the time. So what's one of the impacts of the Great Awakening? Uh, and I, I, I sort of teased this the last time. Uh, one of the impacts of the Great Awakening was that, first off, this idea of everybody coming together and generating enthusiasm will be adopted by political parties. They'll take their cue for this because almost simultaneous or close to simultaneously, you're gonna start seeing in political parties what we call the convention system, uh, that where they bring party members together for either a state convention or a county convention or a national convention as a way of drumming up enthusiasm for a campaign. I would argue it's the primary job of the convention today, really outside just you know, going to the motions of nominating who's gonna be president and vice president of their uh, candidates for their party is to get people excited. And you'll, if you have a good convention, you'll see a convention bump. But the other, the other interesting thing is, and I don't know if I have the book here somewhere or not, I, I probably should have pulled it out. Um, there is a book, there's a book called, um, yeah, here it is. Um, Working at Play. Um, and it's the history of vacations in the United States. And uh, it's written by uh, Cindy Aaron. And what's interesting about uh, this book is one of the arguments is that the vacation really helped or really was spurred on by these re religious revivals. Because you think about a religious revival, it occurred when all the work was done, you would go someplace different, you would be entertained, you could socialize, you could go meet a future wife or husband. It's really a vacation for those people. So when we look at that great awakening, we're going to start seeing, you know, uh, this idea of political aspects of it, and then the origins of the American vacation. Because that's something else we, we don't really think about often is that, why do people take vacations? Where did that come from, right? Well, probably came from there. Well, let's talk about um, romanticism in America. Uh, another big victory at the time was the heart over the head. There was a romantic movement in thought, literature, and the arts. Uh, and what, when we say romantic, romanticism, we're talking about an emphasis on individual freedom and the beauties of nature, right? If you go back and you look at the Hudson School of Art, uh, where they're just painting all these landscapes. Roman romanticism, how can I say this, valued feeling and intuition over pure thought. And probably one of the big romantic movements at this time is transcendentalism. Now, of course, it's got, transcendentalism is going to have its origins in the New England states as well. And most of the members were from wealthy and privileged families in New England. And transcendentalism got its name from an emphasis on a realm of thought which transcended the limits of reason. Um, and it was inspired by European th thinkers like Immanuel Kant, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And it was rooted in New England Puritanism. And what they believed they believed that we all had an inner light, which was a gift of God. And they believed that this inner light was intuition. 
which was a, a, a uh, uh, was just part of the human mind. They believed that an, an ideal order of reality transcended, oh, there's that word, the concrete world of the senses. And probably the leading transcendental thinker at the time was Ralph Waldo Emerson. He spread the transcendental gospel. He in turn influenced Henry David Thoreau. We know Thoreau. Thoreau practiced introspective, self-reliance, and was an individualist. You know Henry David Thoreau. Uh, if you've read Walden, uh, his, his life at Walden Pond, and you can actually go see a replica of, um, of his cabin at Walden Pond. He really wasn't isolated. He could walk into town, it wasn't very far. Uh, people would bring him food all the time. Uh, he, you might argue that he's really a modern day hippie uh, and that uh, some have argued he's the beginning of the environmental movement in the United States. So what Thoreau wanted to do, he wanted to practice plain living and high thinking. So he moved to Walden Pond. Uh, and if you've been there to Walden Pond, it looks a little bit different than when he was there because there are trees. Most of those trees have been chopped down when he was there. Uh, and so he's gonna spend his time devoted to reflection and writing. Now, during the Mexican-American War, which is we're jumping a little bit ahead, he goes to jail because he won't pay the poll tax because he thought the war was gonna be used to spread slavery. Uh, and so after this incident, uh, he wrote the classic essay, Civil Disobedience, uh, which encouraged people to break unjust laws. Well, as we can guess, that, that spreads pretty fan, uh, far. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, followed uh, this kind of teaching and so did uh, Martin Luther King. So let's talk about the rise of, um, of these utopian communities, uh, which, uh, which is a little bit strange, uh, a little bit different than what we're used to. Uh, when we talk about history, but during the Jackson presidency or the Jackson era, there was this move on to develop what they called the perfect community. Um, you know, I, I think if you're old enough, you can remember the Billy Jack movies. Uh, there was a little bit of utopianism there. This had been an American goal for a long time. And between 1800 and 1900, about a hundred utopian communities sprang up. Uh, one of them is the Shakers. Now, officially, they are the United Society of Believers. They're founded by Ann Lee Stanley, Mother Ann, uh, in 1774 in England. And they believed that religious fervor was a sign of inspiration from the Holy Ghost. They would have strange fits in which they saw visions and prophesied. This evolved into a ritual dance, hence the name Shakers. And according to the Shakers, God had a dual personality. Christ was the masculine side. Mother Anne was the feminine side. Now, Mother Anne preached celibacy to prepare Shakers for the uh, perfection that awaited them after death. They were also to abstain from politics, war, alcohol, and tobacco. Now, Mother Anne dies in 1784, but the Shaker community thrives. And by 1830, there are roughly in the United States 20 Shaker communities, but this would be the peak. Um, the Shaker communities, uh, everybody held property in common. Um, the, co the, the communities were governed by a select group of chosen by the chosen people by the ministry. Uh, they emphasized the quality of labor and reward. Uh, their farms were very well run and turned to profit. They, they grew uh, garden seeds and medicinal herbs. But <coughs> I think what you really know the Shakers for is their furniture. Uh, Shaker furniture is still prized for its beauty, its simplicity. I think Oprah Winfrey is um, a big collector of uh, Shaker furniture. Uh, one of the reasons that the, the Shaker communities die out is celibacy. Uh, they could not reproduce and therefore it was really hard to start getting people uh, uh, to join the Shakers. I, I remember one of the last Shakers died maybe 15 years ago at the age of 103. Now on the opposite end from the Shakers, is the Oneida community. Now, the Oneida community was founded by a man named John Humphrey Noyes, a minister. And he came to the conclusion that true conversion came perfection and complete release from sin. In 1836, Noyes and others found a perfectionist community in Vermont. Uh, 10 years later, he announced the doctrine of the complex marriage. 
This meant that every man in the woman was uh, every man in the community was married to every woman in the community. Uh, and Noyes believed that everyone should have sexual relations with each other. Okay, so like I said, um, if you think strange or different uh, communes are unique today, they're not. Now, of course, Noyes was arrested for advocating free love and he fled to New York. There he established the Oneida community. Now the Oneida community shared in food, clothing, shelter. They produced traps, they made silverware. Women enjoyed the same rights as men. Uh, children were raised by the entire community and placed in a common nursery. At the age of 14, boys and girls were trained in sexual activity by elderly women. No one was forced to have sexual relations, but it was encouraged to improve the community. Uh, Noise began to believe in eugenics as well, pairing up superior mates to produce better children. Well, as you can probably imagine, Noise will determine who's the most superior male in the community. And it was him, even though he was in his 60s. Um, in 1879, Noyes flees to Canada to avoid a charge of adultery. The, the community will then abandon the complex marriage and becomes a joint stock company, which we now know today as the Oneida Silverware Company. So yes, I would love to be the historian for the Oneida Silverware Company and how they, come, they, they go back and take a look at that. Uh, and, and, and the reason they, they abandoned the, um, the complex marriage was much like the Shakers where people just didn't want to join because they wanted to marry and have children. Um, with the, the Oneida community, people got married because they were in love and they didn't really feel like sharing their spouse with everybody. And so that's why they eventually said, look, we're not going this route anymore. Uh, now, probably one of the most celebrated of all of these uh, organizations uh, or communities um, is Brook Farm. It's, a, um, it's an early day think tank uh, because it's gonna have Walt, Ralph Waldo Emerson in it and other New England writers. Uh, the idea of Brook Farm came from George Ripley. Now, he attempted to combine farming with a lively intellectual life. So what you were supposed to do during the day was that you, your job was to get out and farm with other intellectuals and, and, and gather the harvest and then at night we sat around dinner, you would all sit around and think about uh, and discuss uh, pithy uh, items of the day, philosophy and history. Um, now, Nathaniel Hawthorne, the writer of the Scarlet Letter joined and he was full of excitement. Uh, but after about a year of shoveling manure, he said, I'm out of here. Now, Brook Farm survived for a while because it was an excellent community school as you can well imagine, because you, know, you had all these big brains there and they drew tuition paying students. But it sort of disbands after they build a new central building. And then right after the, right on the day of the de dedication, lightning hits it and it burns it to the ground. And pretty much they say, okay, screw this, we're out of here. Well, let's talk about some other reforms that go on during this time. One of it's gonna be temperance. Americans are becoming concerned over alcohol consumption. In 1810, the United States had I've got a book here on this. Uh, don't tell me this number, but about 14,000 distilleries uh, producing about 25 million gallons of spirits a year, which if, if you thought about that, that's about three gallons for every man, woman, and child. Uh, that's a lot of alcohol. Uh, and we talked about this earlier that, you know, uh, you didn't drink the water because that was bad for you. But there were some arguments for temperance, people giving up alcohol finally. One was, uh, Religious, you know, you're soldiers of the cross and you should lead blameless lives. And if you're getting drunk, that's not good. So religion was one. Health was another. Benjamin Rust, uh, one of the founding fathers and doctor, uh, had in 1784, had written about the negative effects of alcohol on the body and mind. And then last but not least, and probably one of the big drivers is industrialization in the railroads, right? You could, you could drink and run a pretty good buzz when you're just plowing a field, right? Uh, something simpler like that. But once you get into industrialization, right, if you get on the plane, you really don't want to see your pilot holding a, a martini, right? You didn't want a, a drunk railroad operator. You didn't want drunk people working in the factories. It was very dangerous. In 1826, uh, we had the American Society for the Promotion of Temperance. Man, they should have come up with some better names back then. 
And each person had to take a pledge to give up totally alcohol, total abstinence of alcohol. And so what you would do is you'd have this piece of paper and you would sign your name and then you'd have a giant T on there saying that you were giving up alcohol for good. This is where we, uh, this meant total abstinence. Hence, we get the term teetotaler out of that. When you hear somebody's a teetotaler, although I don't think that that, that may term may be falling out for my generation, for younger generations, but still, th still did, uh, still, still does exist. In 1833, another group came up, the American Temperance Union. Um, and their question was, all right, look, do we want to get rid of alcohol or is it, should we just try to get people to moderate their alcohol belief? Because uh, could you win the total wiping out of alcohol in the United States? Uh, many believe the so-called what they call demon rum should be outlawed. Well, then we're going to have another group coming in and talking about prison and asylum reforms. And, and you, I think this is another one of those things that if you just stop and think about it, you think about prisons and then you start thinking, okay, uh, how long have we had prisons? Uh, when did that idea came about? Where did, where did it come from? Well, early on in America, usually there were no prisons. Um, if you committed a crime, you were going to be executed for some of your crimes. Uh, you would be branded, put in the stocks, uh, or you'd be banished, right? You, you have to leave our, uh, this area. Uh, and if you don't leave, it's on pain of death. So what you did was you sent your criminals to somewhere else. Um, and so the idea there was to remove deviant or the dependent away from their corrupted influences in somewhere else. Now, soon we'll start getting what we call asylums, orphanages, poor houses, and then eventually prisons that'll spread across the country. <coughs> now, the original prison was that you would go, and, and the first one that we built was in Philadelphia. It's, I hope it's last time I was there and looking at it, it was, it was falling in disrepair. I, somebody told me recently they're trying to keep it together. And the idea of the prison was they would take you in Philadelphia and they'd put you behind bars <coughs> in strict solitary confinement where your job was to read the Bible and think about what you did and you'd be by yourself. And then you had a little courtyard that you could walk out by yourself. Um, and so your job was to be doing penance, hence the term penitentiary, right? Well, the Auburn system, which comes out of Auburn, New York, replaced that system uh, of strict solitary confinement. It allowed some social contact among workers and some vocational work, but still flogging was the norm along with moral and religious instruction. It wasn't a very pleasant place to be. Uh, and much like today, when we see with COVID, is that they were also uh, dens of disease. Asylums were not better. When, for people with mental illness, what they would do is they would put them uh, in chains uh, in the dark. They would whip them, beat them uh, as a way of trying to cure them. <coughs> if you ever want to see an interesting, sort of somewhat of a story of that, is watch uh, the madness of King George when they think he's insane. And one of their solutions is to put him in a straitjack and beat him. Uh, now, one of the activists at this time was Dor Dorothea Dix. Uh, she was, um, a leading advocate for reforming asylums and arguing that we need to have more humane treatment for the insane rather than punishment. And there's a great book on this too uh, by David Oshinsky called uh, Bellevue, uh, the history of Bellevue Hospital in New York. Next, we wanna talk about women's rights. The abolitionist movement gave uh, rise to women's movement because women see themselves in the same boats as slaves, right? Because as a woman, you cannot vote. You cannot own property. You did not um, have your own reproductive rights. Um, you couldn't attend colleges. You, when you married, your property went right over to your husband. So you could not really own anything. And so women are gonna be very active in the anti-slavery movement and they identify with slaves. Uh, so, one of the high points of this early women's movement, we'll come back to it uh, in the spring, uh, was the Seneca Falls Conference in 1848. Here they issued the Declaration of Sentiments and it's patterned after the Declaration of Independence. And it listed the grievances of women. In fact, if you go there today and, and the building still stands, uh, you go there today, 
uh, they have the Declaration right there. And it, it reads just like the Declaration of Independence. Um, but first talking about all, all people are uh, created equal and that then they list all the grievances they have toward this, uh, this country's treatment toward women. Uh, it's a, a very well done place if you get a chance to go. All right, the last thing we're gonna talk about tonight is the rise of American literature. Uh, and uh, finally, American literature getting some respect across the ocean. Starting off with uh, Emily Dickinson. Now she was one of the most original poets of their time. She lived as a recluse in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts. I've been to her house, it's pretty cool. Uh, and only a couple of her poems were published from her, before her death. She suffered from severe eye trouble. I didn't see well, often stayed in her house. She would bake cookies and from her second floor, uh, drop them down to children in the neighborhood. And she, the rumor was that she um, had, was in love with a married minister, but was unrequited. She, that wasn't gonna happen. So the themes of her poetry are life, death, fear, loneliness. Uh, you know, she once said that success is counted sweetest by those who never succeed. And if you really want to read a, a good book about Emily Dickinson, a um, pretty dramatic book, it, uh, it was published maybe 10 years ago. It's called uh, Lives Like Loaded Guns uh, because she really had an interesting family life in that area. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, she never tried to find readers for intensely private poetry. Now, one person we've already talked about is Nathaniel Hawthorne. He lived in Salem, Massachusetts. And he was always haunted by the knowledge that his forebearers, one of his forebearers was a judge at the Salem witch trials. And so his books really explored the theme of evil and its consequences, pride, selfishness, secret guilt, and the impossibility in his mind of rooting sin out of the human soul. Probably um, his greatest novel uh, was The Scarlet Letter, which was sort of a, a, a sympathetic analysis of adultery. Uh, you probably also, uh, seen his book um, uh, or read his book, The House of the Seven Gables, which by the way, is an actual house in Salem uh, that you can tour. And if you go around uh, Halloween, they have reenactors in the house who uh, reenact parts of the book from uh, in different rooms of the house. And it's really good. Um, and you can actually visit his house too. He lives maybe a quarter of a mile down from uh, uh, the Alcott's house of uh, Little Women in, in, in Concord, along with um, Thoreau and um, uh, Emerson. Well, one of the most inventive genius of the time is, of course, Edgar Allan Poe, born in Virginia. Um, he's considered by Europeans as probably America's most inventive uh, writers, uh, probably the most important American writer, according to Europeans. Um, but he was fairly hard drinking, very quarrelsome. Um, he was the master of the Gothic horror. Uh, he invented the detective story, and some argue that he also invented um, the science fiction story. <coughs> and we all know his good works of the uh, great works of the Raven, the Telltale Heart, the Pit and the Pendulum. He dies. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, he dies in Baltimore. Interestingly, um, he was found unconscious in a in a in a gutter and died in a hospital a little bit later after that. <coughs> um, and there have been a lot of theories on how he died. One of the more interesting ones was a, a, a veterinarian who was studying rabies outbreak at the time, read about uh, Poe and looked at his symptoms and concluded that maybe it had rabies, which he could have gotten being unconscious in a, in a, in a gutter of rats and everything else around. Um, he's buried in Baltimore and for almost 50 years and it stopped within the last 10 years, somebody would go and leave a, a bottle of cognac, I believe it was, or brandy and a rose on the anniversary of his death. And that occurred every, for about 50 years. And then it suddenly stopped suggesting whoever did that is dead. There is a debate. He was born, he worked a long time in Richmond, uh, Virginia, and you can go to his house in Richmond. Virginia would like to have the body brought back. Of course, Baltimore says no. Uh, and by the way, now we, we uh, right now on um, Money Night Football, we have the Baltimore Ravens playing. Another person I want to mention is uh, Herman Melville. Now, today, Melville, we all know Melville, was considered one of America's great novelists. Uh, but in his lifetime, he saw his literary career evaporate. 
Now, as a young man, he served aboard a whaling ship. I think we all know where this is going. Uh, he jumped ship and spent time in Tahiti, good place to jump ship. He returned to Boston as a seaman aboard the US Navy. Uh, and in 1851, he wrote the story Moby Dick, which is a, is a really a deal, detailed book on the working of, a, of the American whale industry. But it's also a story about obsession and revenge. Uh, it's one of the finest novels written by an American, and it's actually based on a somewhat true story. Uh, you can read this. Um, there's, a, I think, Nathan Philbeck. I may have that book somewhere around here, uh, somewhere uh, called... Uh, the heart of the sea. And uh, actually you can read a first person account of the wreck of the whale ship Essex. The Essex was uh, uh, off the coast of uh, Chile and uh, it got attacked by a whale uh, and sank the ship. And uh, the survivors of the ship had to get on three lifeboats and eventually the lifeboats are separated and uh, they're at sea for almost 90 days. One of the lifeboats disappears, one lands on an island. They found another one in which uh, the, uh, the survivors in the boat were uh, chewing on bones of human beings. They had, uh, they, they had resorted to cannibalism. And it's interesting story is that, so they're gonna resort to cannibalism. And so what they do is they say, okay, look, we're gonna draw straws. And whoever has the shortest straw is the person we're going to eat. Whoever has the second shortest straw has to kill the person they're going to eat. So they draw straws and the two straws are two best friends. They had signed up on the ship for an adventure so one gets the shortest straw, meaning he's gonna die and his best friend has to shoot him. Uh, the first mate, uh, when he gets back, uh, he, he, he comes back and he lives in uh, somewhere off in the coast of New England. And uh, when he eventually dies, they find his attic and it's full of crackers because he never wanted to get to the point where he would starve to death again. Uh, in fact, <coughs> Ron Howard did the movie version of this that wasn't well received and I haven't seen it. Um, called In the Heart of the Sea with uh, Chris Hensworth and Tom Holla. Well, I think we've, we've hit enough things tonight. Oop, some chat stuff. Uh, yeah, so if I do that, uh, the Methodist campground. Okay, great. Now these summer revivals and during the Depression, there's still a piece of property close to the sea. Yeah. Um, and Poe's, yeah, buried over there. I've been to Poe's grave. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of times, you know, when you do a history class, you don't really talk a lot about American literature or the impact of some of these religious revivals. Uh, that's pretty cool. Glad I saw that. All right, well, I'm going to stop here. And the, the next time we meet, we're going to talk about industrialization uh, and shipping and railroads and then get on to um, the, the uh, Jackson era uh, and talk about Andrew Jackson a little bit more. Uh, I forgot. Oh, last time I accidentally cut everybody off. I didn't mean to do that, so I won't do it this time.